Hi, and welcome. Um, my name is Aria Curtis, and I'm a graduate assistant at the Piper Center for Creative Writing. Uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Simon Ortiz and welcome you to the Indigenous <coughs> Thunderstorm Morning uh, Red Ink Reading for Standing Rock. Uh, Simon J. Ortiz is an Acoma Pueblo Nation poet, writer, storyteller, singer sometimes, author of Going for the Rain, A Good Journey, Woven Stone, Out There Somewhere, From Sand Creek, The People Shall Continue, The Good Rainbow Road, and other books. He has been writing for the, for the past 40 plus years. His voice is the voice of indigenous American land, culture, and community. Currently a Regents Professor of English and American Indian Studies at Arizona State University as an indigenous American poet and writer. He is an internationally acclaimed and six of his poetry and fiction books have been translated into Italian, Chinese, Korean, Spanish, and German. Ortiz has also been a tribal leader of his Acoma Pueblo community as a translator, interpreter, and first lieutenant governor, as well as the chairperson of the Haku Museum and Cultural Center Board of Trustees. He is outspoken as a necessary advocate and proponent of indigenous liberation and decolonization. Professor Ortiz is also the father of three children and the grandfather and great-grandfather of 10 beautiful grandchildren. Over the years, he has been honored and awarded the following, Golden Tibetan Antelope Prize for International Poetry from King Hai, China, 2013, the National Endowment for the Arts, 1970 and 1980, Lifetime Achievement Award for returning the gift native, for the gift native North American writers in April 1999, excuse me, 1991, the Lenin Foundation Artist in Residence Award the summer, in summer 2000, the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Writers Award from 1996 to 1998, and the New, New Mexico Humanities Award in 1985. Um, I welcome, join me in welcoming Simon Ortiz, Laura Tohi, Henry Quintero, and Kenny Dyer Redneck. Well, Buwati. How are you? Good. <laughs> because we that's what we always wish for. Because that's what we always need, to be good and to feel good and happy and fulfilled and hopeful and positive. If we think positive and act positive, things are perfect, right? Well, sometimes they're okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I am from uh, Aco, or Acoma Pueblo, originally. I've been here 10 years at uh, ASU, and uh, in the English department and American Indian Studies. Today, we're going to do a reading as red ink for Standing Rock. Red ink is a journal the entire name is called Red Ink, uh, International Journal of Indigenous Literature, Art, and Humanities. And it's been operating, not here, but at the uh, University of Arizona for more than 25 years. And the past two years or so, three years, uh, they were losing support. So it needed a home, and we said, we'll take it. It's so far it's so good. We have uh, issued two issues of red ink last spring of 16 and this winter, uh, actually in November of uh, really the 16 as well, 2016. Our next issue is coming out in uh, April of 17. Well, we also have an issue devoted a very special issue to Standing Rock. Standing Rock very fast, very quickly, I'll tell you, is in North Dakota. It's one of the reservations that are uh, the homes of the Sioux, uh, Lakota Sioux people and their nation. And for the past several years, especially last year, they've been in a struggle in opposition to an oil pipeline that is coming from northern part of the state of North Dakota 
and is designed to go all the way to uh, Illinois, to oil refineries. And the people of Standing Rock uh, homelands, or reservations as the federal government insists on calling them, Indian reservations, uh, is uh, a site where Sitting Bull, the very famous and uh, heroic uh, and resistant uh, to American takeover of uh, indigenous lands uh, stood and eventually he was killed, assassinated, you know, in the 1870s. Well, his people continue and today very much so because they insist that they have the sovereignty and the will and the wish to do what they need to do. In this case, it is to oppose the pipeline that's coming from the north and passes, is aimed right at the doorstep of uh, the reservation called Standing Rock. And it will proceed under the lake, Lake Oahe, which is a dam, uh, constructed back in the 1930s uh, on the Missouri River. The Cannonball River flows into Lake Oahe at that point, and the plan for the, for the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline is to go under the, the lake. But the people of Sandy Rock said, Zazi Newa Ya Anir Kuan, Rumano. We are not going to let this take place. We are going to stop the progress of this pipeline. And so far, they have stopped the progress. However, the federal government, of course, before Trump was elected president, had already given the authoriz authorization to the uh, Corps of Engineers, which is in charge of the project, and they had uh, contracted with a corporate uh, conglomerate uh, out of Texas and uh, called the Energy Transfer Partners. It's a corporate uh, outfit with $3.7 billion of investment money, including President Trump's money. I don't know how much. Supposedly upon election and a few days later, he was supposed to have divested himself, but nobody knows for sure whether he is still a uh, investor or not. Well, the project is still on, even though there was a uh, stop put to it by President Obama. But the Corps of Engineers decided to go ahead and stop it for a while, but not in a final or absolute way. Well, this is why the struggle continues. And this is why Red Ink, our journal here, members of it and supporters of the, not only the Red Ink journal, but also of Standing Rock, uh, decided that we would do a reading. So we have gathered several people and uh, they were named, uh, I think Laura Tohi, Lori Tohi is not going to be here uh, until later. She's teaching class right now. And uh, Ms. Diaz, Natalie Diaz, who is a new faculty in English, uh, is in Ireland right now, I think, or uh, she will be, so she won't be here. But we have other readers uh, and uh, very heroic <coughs> characters in their own right, like Henry Quintero, who uh, will be first. And then we have uh, Kyle Wilson, who's a graduate, and, and also Henry is a graduate of the Creative Writing Program here at ASU. And then we have Kenny Dyer Redner, who's a fiction writer. And then we have me, who will also do a poem or two or sing a song, okay? So let's start, who's, who did I forget? I think I named everybody uh, that's here right now. We'll start with you, Henry. Go for it. For really. Uh, I want to 
to thank you, uh, Simon, for the introduction. And uh, uh, again, I want to thank uh, the Autumn people for holding this place and always making this piece of land right here a center of learning and sustenance for all the people in the valley. And um, this first poem I'm going to read to you is, uh, uh, Simon knows I used to travel around quite a bit. Um, and uh, through traveling around, I got to listen to a lot of older people, how they think about the world, how they um, engage the world, what, how people put value on what life is. And um, when we reflect on, on the DAPL issue, a lot of people say, oh, you know, all these indigenous people, all these anti-DAPL people are, 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 are really hurting our economy. They're anti-economy. No. We're not anti-economy. We understand through our, our participation, through our immediate reality, that there's a different way where everybody wins, and especially our future generations. And this, I decided to read this poem. It's, it's, uh, it, it takes place uh, a little towards San Diego. Um, and there was a ceremony that I was helping out years ago um, where we were helping wash the war off uh, Kumeyaay young man who had come back. Kumeyaay are a, a, a great people. They're related to the Mojaves and the Pai. Speak a beautiful language. A lot of times people forget that uh, they make up stories about what Tijuana means. And Tijuana actually means the place where the bay meets the ocean. Uh, beautiful language they have. So this is, this is called uh, When You Hit the Drum So Hard You Listen. <clears throat> it was an old Kiowa man on the north side toward my drum space that prayed with a big corn husk of tobacco mix in the early morning under the stars in the Kumeyaay Hills. The stars slowly brushed over with the wet cotton ocean air shushed over uh, the scrub oaks, a toddler's wind blowing eastward. This breath of life, the kiss of morning mist mixing with the pop of that old man's partial as he prayed. He prayed for his great-grandson, who while his sonny boy and his granddaughter-in-law had conceived him in love, knowing that it was a night under the stars, <coughs> and all that was shown with the light upon creation that his grandson was conceived. Like that, on a good Friday night, payday steak dinner on the beach, like that, under the stars, next to the ocean, in love of a young Navy career from Oklahoma U that was going somewhere, his second year in San Diego, bringing Grandpa over. That old man knew, however, they made a home in a box, slept in a box, that his sonny boy went away to a naval base, driving in a box with four wheels. Later, as she came closer, she would go in that same box over and over to see a doctor that told them that everything would be all right. Wolf gray braids in red and blue cotton cloth swung just before the edge of swept earth where the ashes of the tobacco and that nam tom, that corn husk, fell like gray snow moistened in the fog. When the boy was about to be born, they stepped out of the box and into the boxes with wheels, drove to a huge box with a lot of doctors and nurses who covered their faces with masks. He said in his prayer that it, they must be ashamed of what they do, how they treat women folk like that. He prayed on how they put his granddaughter-in-law on a rectangular table box when their beautiful son was born, all his fingers and toes with all the consciousness of being a perfect human baby. His resonance toward the lit end of that smoke rose cherry as he told the fire how they put that baby in a plexiglass box and wheeled his little body into a huge square room where his father and his grandpa Keaton could look at him through a big rectangular window. That old man cried and cried that his grandson would know a world, a life out of a box. He prayed that he would see his grandson and family live a good life. And when he got past old and stopped breathing, that these people, those ones with masks, would not bury him in a box so he could touch the earth 
so he could be the earth. He wanted to continue to cradle his grandson's feet when he stepped out of that box like his grandparents did for him and introduce him to that sun shining round on the horizon, bending the darkness like an arching bow. Thank you. So uh, I invite all of you as we reflect on Dapple, if you have any qualms, to think differently about what's going on. Because when, when we indigenous people talk about no Dapple for the Lakota people, talk about no Dapple for the people that are living up in Standing Rock, remember that that pipeline was, was geared to go right through a predominantly Anglo area. And because that was spoken up against, it moved farther south. And in that move a little farther south, the color of skin got a little darker. But yet, where that pipeline is going through right now, the people that are speaking out against it are speaking out against it for everybody's children. And so I just want to make that crystal clear. And with that, I'm going to move about 25 years back. And this is an old poem I wrote. I used to write a lot uh, of uh, animal people poems. Some people describe them as uh, Nazi, po uh, what is it, uh, Beatrix Potter after a Nazi death camp experience, or an X-rated version of Wind in the Willows. Um, <clears throat> and that is also knowing the knowledge of what it means to be indigenous and what that means in the greater sense of Americana when we realize that over a good third of the lexicon of words that we use every day in American English come from indigenous words. One of them right here is raccoon, Algonquin, the one who wears a mask. I like wearing masks when I steal things too. But this is called a raccoon wants, and please feel free to think of the raccoon as Donald Trump. <laughs> raccoon wants. It is the darkest hours of bear's night that brings out the worst within us all, holding fast to fact that Ursus hides in grace within the walls of dreams of days. I, the one who feels with hands, sport a black mask in honor of the thieving I'm about to do. Beneath the shack rule and fat maple back cigars from leaves, I taste the sweetness of forgetfulness, of careless spills of hot sap between the white buckling stabs of floorboards until an ore of earth and frost softens. A sugar-like glass is what I live for. I wash my hands of what I am about to do. Two, it is the art of sale, the presentation of myself as I light another fat one in the full presence of autumn. Running my slick manicured fingers through my salt and pepper hair, chuckling lightly in the dark while climbing apple trees, I calculate an air of ignorance, an excess, taking just one bite of ripe red fruit, then lobbing in windfall each apple down until the trees in three rows produce their piles of ruined fruit. These are the knots behind my mask, and this is what I live for. Three, this is insurance. The calculated movement wagered against the fear within our world, granting Miss Bullfrog her amnesty in exchange for the whereabouts of eggs, betting the tadpoles will soon be 10 times her weight. Sometimes it is the lectures that last hours that come with such great reward, convincing the gadwalls that a flock of four is far too much, while bringing notice from the likes of fox or feral cat that two is a far better number, reliable as wood, taking two for payment for my patience and my time. It was the rails who did not listen, and in their quiet sleep, I wash my hands and add the fat of several rings around my tail. Four. It is the plotting of progress, the conspiring of roads within the mine, the succession of trees within the rising suburb that almost drunken brings me my first taste of dog food. 
a first dream of orange peels and coffee, a watershed. I am the man of gross perfection, an adept, a raccoon who washes food along the waste of gutters, running out of the inside of earth, out into open fields now peaceful as before, cleaner with the blue milk of comet running through the roots of weeds, everlasting evergreen of cardboard freshness from cars parked along the walkway. I mastered the trickle down, knowing all is not soluble in water, the fat around my waist growing with every passing deal until I can no longer live among the rooks of apple trees, surrendering my throne to flocks of cowbirds. The rule of speculation states, the property with waterfront or with Spanish names holds the highest value for the longest time. And I have gambled woodchuck who wants to sell or trade. All my inquiries have been ignored, and it is time to make a personal statement above his intentions of leaving soon, without penalty, etc. It is in a smooth sod house with polished plastered hallways, and it is his intent to run a chisel through my neck. It is woodchuck. I will rent, gut, eviscerate. He is thick, holding on to a sensible weight with the succulent bulbs of fresh greens. Even in his sleep, he shares with bear. Woodchuck keeps his pale belly groomed and fresh with his bed of grass. How horribly that woodchuck wails in want of breath, whistling for water as I lace my fingers round his neck, trying to choke some sense to leave my den. Woodchuck plunging chisels deep within my side for want of wood or blood, and I can only chuckle, whisper in his little ear a joke about the gee around my waist, then twist until the popping knuckles of the neck xylophone and spastic defecation. I absorb in this his want as a parent company, relish his smell, his fear, the taste of sinew within the sockets of his eyes. I sit back, consume, and lick my wounds. This early spring has brought a misunderstanding of the weather. Perhaps the weight of fat I've earned has led me to this singular fever it focuses on a drop of early morning dew hanging from the slobber of my mouth like a spider's silk. Perhaps in this heat, I have kept that still. It being all a dream of meetings with boards of directors, never telling fox or crow of my delight in acquisition by lunging at their faces, supplying them with a mensur for memento till fox chirps at nothing and crow circles in a puzzling thirst. It is this satisfaction of piercing my own lover's ears with a queer needle of teeth racing from the den, bleeding with my own version of the eagle dance, penis bone, te tearing through the lobes, holy stun, colored with fever, rabbit. I have wandered back to subdivisions to wash my hands in dirty water I cannot drink, to sample dog food I cannot swallow, foaming, at every dog and child, surrounded, blind, I realize that despite my sex, I have become the mother of a people. Thank you. Good afternoon, or morning, whatever it is for you. So, uh, my name's Kyle, and I'm Diné, Navajo, and from Fort Defiance, Arizona. Um, I think what I, 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 like, I like to write about is family and how family can extend itself to not just blood relations but to people within your communities. And I think America moved away from that at some point uh, through colonization. And um, sometimes I want to write a letter to America, you know, and just say, what's up? Um, sometimes uh, if I were to write a letter, I, 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 I'm sure maybe you all might have thought that at some point in your lives. Uh, if I were to write a letter, it would say something like, Dear America, um, we are still here. You do not know this, but we are still here. That's not a threat. It's not an accusation. No way of warning. 
but is a fact that colonization happened and we are still here. This is the, this is your alarm in the dawn of the 21st century. And um, why, would it, why would you think that we need a wake up call in the middle of the American dream? Where I'm from, um, Navajo tradition teaches you Hanjong and Ken. And um, basically, loosely translated, we're talking about um, balance and family. Uh, Hanjong is the beauty way. Hanjong is when everything in your, in your life is beautiful. It's what we want for ourselves, it's what we want for each other. And Ke is the, is, when we're talking about um, relationships, um, our actual family, uh, loved ones, and also our interactions with each other, and also community. And uh, that's what I like to write about, and uh, I think America needs to get back into that frame of mind where we can extend our family <coughs> to the community, and I think that's what should happen in Standing Rock. Um, because as Henry said, we're looking out for all of our children, and not just the indigenous children, everyone, and for further generations, uh, further down the line. And then we've got to think about uh, how we fit within timelines and all of that, um, but you know, I'm not gonna get into that too much. Uh, my first poem that I'm gonna read is about um, being home, being from uh, Fort Defiance on a reservation, and also uh, I'm from Water Clans, um, Tachini and Torachini, and um, this poem's called Born for a Small Town, Born into the City. A day ends with the run of red it disguised the bitter death of a stranger. I am told by the ones that know, ones that have lived. Mine began with the intersect of mountains that have peaked, then fell to buildings that can scrape the sky, but a bridge between. They can fill the hemispheres of my mind for days, much like a mother holds a child's hand in the father's way. This day starts with an evening that pools the reservation floor, cornrows of rusty sand for elders and day olders, what children we are. This day stars are vivid because they are the ones I know. To say tonight flutes a moon in dusk by fire and a river flow ascension, is to say I don't remember it. It is to say I don't remember my grandfather, his cast of water onto flame, his benediction, his sacrifice. Open fields of concrete used to splatter about years ago, but now they are spackled together in mantled cohesion. As a child, I played baseball in, the, in dirt soft as snow. I kept the sand from my pockets in a shoebox. A Mars evening dawns. These streets plow for miles, and there is no laugh measurable enough to hold. We are all so melted together in the five o'clock traffic. To be deaf is not to be encased, but to be lucky. Ask me who are you? Ask me who I am, and I'll tell you I don't know which direction we all go about. I will say water at times runs red and bitter for us all. At times they do, but not always. And, uh, I think a lot of the, the common thread that's happening in, in these poems I'm reading today are uh, a lot with water in, in different states, and also uh, it's about, uh, like I said, family and the extension of family and how we perceive family uh, at different times. Generations, the layers in which snow falls. Never have I pooled in the snowstorm like this December night with the flash of flakes that river down and street lamps that burn the fresh fall. I was never so close to my breath to see it ascend into something above myself. Something carnivorous taught me to never believe in marriage and separation, never trust the sacrament, the sacrament behind water turning into frozen powder and then back to water. 
Are we built to subtract <coughs> ourselves from what doesn't add up? In turn, do we take away small sums of others? It takes the dead of winter to show us life, the snowfall to move things slow, to show me my breathing, the addition of night to show there is light in every way. Surgeons can needle their way through our soul's darkest caverns, deft into crevices of otherwise dead sacks. They maneuver for connectedness, pulse of life, breathe into this world, much like we all flood the lungs of others. Grandfather forecasted life as his place with flowering stems bridged by the choices we made. What a child I was then and still toddle through this door. The night asks its way in, usually cavernous and cool with ghostly archetypes stewing about in a cubby. As simple as a child's pluses and minuses, all is taken and given, separated and married. Our days, our fathers, our land, our water, no hours last forever. It would, seem like, it would seem we make this world primitive. We always do, we always will. We all stem from knots, we unhand and leave. We are not supposed to understand how we get married to the thought of growing close, never separating shadows. The small hours yawn with daylight. I sleep kindly with Mars glinting and all-star morning outside, waiting for the gift of one memory to escalate down to me. Evolution starts with death and from which all is born. The layers in which snow falls with the crackle of tinder over blankets of the day's drift. Mothers let go of sons and we work ourselves flush within the furrows of others. And then this one is really specifically about Standing Rock and about water and about protecting our generations, and but also reminding uh, the country, the nation, everybody that uh, you know this col colonization has happened for centuries. Uh, ter terrorism has been happening for centuries, and um, I'm also reminded of 9/11, and I remember. Um, watching TV, one of the commentators saying that this is the first time terrorism has ever struck uh, America so hard. Uh, and I, I didn't really agree with that. It didn't, it didn't sit well with me. Um, so I mentioned 9-11 in here just to remind everybody that, you know, we kind of had the same similarities uh, of sorts. So this is called, uh, We Wade Within the Web of Rivers for Our Children. The cleft between you and I expands, my lungs severed inches, inches apart. You orphan me for a timeline, unfolded thoughts of you, cuffed, tidy, and taut, colonized in the far reaches of the hemispheres in my mind. We are all transplanted at an arm's length to midnight. Within reach, I voyage to darkness for the warmth of voices. You have sprawled in ocean for years to conquer and to take away, but still need to be shored alongside anchored banks, fused with the core of grandfathers. You learn to, di to dissect what has been done over time. We will never forget how all generations have been there. They have been reaped so others may sow. Like us, their children have been taken away. They too gathered to steal away from the night they also held hands, followed each other's voices, found cover, a place to hide, enough space for one or another. We all have grandfathers in heaven. We all prayed for tribesmen, left rising from the ashes into the valley of webbed rivers, where mothers became fathers, fathers are brothers. Together, all were blackened, made gray. A tribe like mine, a tribe like ours, they found a way to breathe. Much like firemen march into falling buildings, already angels and weightless, they ascend the stairwell. They all carry water. They all carry oxygen. 
they all bring out what is alive. What has man saved in the killing of Indians? That black viscous lining stored within as water shed from an autumn sky. In the well of a cornrow, grandfather belled, he courted war with stories of survival about lives that mattered. He said, they left the harvest behind, the tall and green in piles of ears, like wood for winter, like water for life, grandpa said. In streams, we gather to make an ebbing resistance in waves. Engulfed in communal strength, our children learn to defend. By all means necessary, we wade within the web of rivers build a dam, gather our water in our arms, stitch two veins into one, lives course together, we form a bloodline. Thank you. The question on that lady. Oh. I think, I'm going to do this. She is a Laura Tohi, and she gets in the happy thing. She put a cheat in the bushes chain. Johanna ate with Lando, that she cheated on my dish, Gizzi Dashamella. Says an old yede, and I see Nasha. She might a Laura Florence will yende, she jet a Benson Toki will yende. She yajna kia cut or a son schlep. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Simon, for having this event so that our voices, our indigenous voices, can be heard at this conference. Um, which we're talking today about DAPL. I think it's very important that we as Native peoples um, have a voice in this because we have been resisting American colonization for over 500 years. So this resistance is not new to us. We have been doing this and we are not immigrants to this country. We are the original First Nations people of this land. So our voices are very important, and I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, what, how I grew up from up on the Navajo Reservation. I grew up with an extended family. Um, I grew up with grandparents, aunts, mothers, uncles, brothers. And um, during the summer, I spent a lot of time with my maternal grandmother. She was from uh, Coyote Canyon. And I remember in the summertime, because she didn't have um, running water in her home, she didn't have a washing machine in her home. We used to have to uh, carry our laundry in a um, pillowcase and walk about two miles to the windmill to wash her clothes. And we carried uh, Tide soap, I think we had, and we carried a washboard and a basin of water. We, uh, we went well, we just took the basin to the windmill two miles away, and we had to wash our water. And there was also a grandfather that would appear in his pickup truck and he'd scold us because he thought we were playing in the water, he thought we were wasting the water, but we would tell him, you know, we were doing our laundry. And my grandmother would let him rant on a little bit, and then she would say, so when we were saying that we were washing our clothes and then she'd point to the fence and our clothes would be fluttering over there on the on this makeshift clothesline and that would shut him up and then he'd leave <laughs> <laughs> but there were times too when we'd be walking home and it would be in the summertime and she would say uh, she'd tell us about water and it was during the in august when we had the monsoon rains i remember once we walked by this pond <coughs> And she started telling us about this water. And um, so I'm gonna read that. She told me a lot of things, my cousin and I. Meeting the spirit of water. When you come to a river or lake or pond, one you haven't met, you must meet its spirit. Place your hand into its belly, feel the energy, stroke its power, caress the life source. Let it run you through your hands. Say a prayer. You must meet its spirit, and it will never steal you, was what she told us as children. I appreciate what she told me about water and how we water is part of our existence, and in the desert even more so. 
So it was from her that I uh, started writing other poems about water, and this is uh, called, uh, and this is kind of a, an old poem, but I, I like to read it anyway. It's called Female Rain. Uh, in the Navajo worldview, there are dualities, maleness and femaleness, so water, uh, rain is either female or it's male rain. Female rain dancing from the south, cloudy, cool, and gray, pregnant with rain child. At dawn, she gives birth to a wet sustenance. Flowers bow with wet sustenance, luminescence all around. Male rain, he comes riding a dark horse, angry, malevolent, cold, bringing floods and heavy winds. Warrior rain, having a 49 night, then rides away, leaving his enemy behind. My son went up to um, North Dakota to be part of the um, movement up there. And he said that, you know, that he told me a little bit about what he did up there, and he was saying that uh, people are calling us protesters, water protesters. But he said, we're not protesters, we're water protectors. We're trying to protect the water for not only the people that are there, but as, you, as Kyle mentioned and Henry mentions, for the future generations of all people. And I think this is a worldwide movement because I think they see the truth in what Native peoples are doing. Um, and if we don't stand up, if we don't say stop, if we don't say don't do this to the land, don't do this to the earth, don't do this to the air, don't do this to us, where are we going to draw the line? There has to be a place, a time where we have to stop. And now is the time as we see more of the environment being degraded, the air being polluted, the water being polluted, you know, bringing bottled water wherever we go. So we, you know, this is a, I think a very crucial time in our history where uh, we are looking at the possibility of, of what's gonna happen next especially now with the President Trump. Um, okay, so I'm gonna read this one other little short story that Simon asked me to read a story. This is an old story, and uh, it's called um, Summer Ceremony. She was born in early spring, nine months after her mother went to the Chinle Summer Ceremony. It was there her mother first saw him, passing through the low doorway of the summer shade house, his face partially hidden in the shadows of his hat. He wore a silver belt buckle that caught the light from the lantern, and that's why she turned her head. He sat down at one end of the long table with the other people, waiting to be served. She felt his eyes watching her as she glided back and forth from stove to table, carrying the food. Her long blue skirt swayed gently with every step over her narrow hips. When she reached up to pump more air into the kerosene lantern, she felt embarrassed because he had looked away too quickly. Later, the people gathered outside where the men had piled together logs of twisted cedar and lit them. The fire flamed against the starry night. Soon, burning cedar smell filled the air. Fire crackled and sparks flew out in all directions. She was standing across from him when he saw her again. The flames glowed across her face. Her eyes were dark and moist like a deer's in a midnight forest. She saw him standing next to a group of men. They spoke in low voices and laughed and discussed eligible young women. The men were eager to dance with, having brought enough money to last until morning. It was then she thought she heard them talking about her. That one, she's married to that old man from Cross Canyon. They say she was still a girl when they married. And you know, you can't dance with married women, so better leave her alone. Just then the old man came for her. They left together, moving away from the others and the fire. She lay there in the dark and listened to his breathing. 
She was restless that night and listened to the voices rising and falling to the beat of the drum. And slowly the voices came inside her. Come, let's go somewhere where it's pretty. I like your silver earrings. Hey, uh, hey. She got up then, put her shoes on, smoothed out her clothes and grabbed her Pendleton shawl. She moved through the pickup trucks parked side by side. The fire reflected off the glass and chrome. She was half looking for her sister, half hoping she would find him instead. She imagined him again the way he had looked at her briefly when she looked briefly when she reached up to pump the lantern. She imagined his tall good looks under the cowboy hat, the belt buckle he must have won in a rodeo. But why was she thinking of him? She was married, and he was probably already with a girl wearing tight jeans and heavy perfume. And here she was with her hair fixed in the old way and her shawl around her shoulders. She was no rodeo fan. So she stopped and watched the couples moving in rhythmic circles around the fire, the fringes of the women's shawl swaying with each step. She felt someone come up behind her and stand next to her. He watched her. Then he spoke to her, but in a teasing way at first. Oh, I thought you were my cousin from the Red House clan. He said that in case she was related to him, but she didn't greet him as a relative. He watched her eyes and they glistened the way they had earlier. He waited, then she turned towards him. She saw his smile. They heard the voices singing, rising with the flames and the smoke. They left then, silently knowing what this night meant moving through the darkness, in and out between the sagebrush and cedar trees, her warm blanket, the voices echoing off the canyon walls, shadows swaying, shadows dancing, till the desert dawn turned shades of orange and pink, and the singing stopped. She returned alone then. Only once she looked back to see him standing under the tree, smiling at her. The baby was wrapped in a small bundle when her mother brought her home. Even then, the old man called her his own. She'd sit, my daughter. But the other women, they whispered behind her back, gossiping about old men, too old to beget children. Whose daughter was she? While they slapped bread, dough, and peeled potatoes, digging out the roots with sharp knives. The old man knew he ignored them and instead shared his stories with her. That's how she grew up among the stories. Remember the stories. It is because I love you, I tell them. Keep them inside you. No one can take them away, was what he told her. Even when he sat in the wheelchair, eating out of metal trays on which the girl now fed him, he told her stories. Stories of his childhood, stories of giants and creatures that once walked the earth, stories of men, Stories of people coming out of water. Stories of a baby girl found in a cloudy mist. When he finished, they sat quiet for a long time, watching the shadows change shape, change shape and turn dark. She went back the next day. The door was open, only now the bed was stripped. The blankets lay crumbled on the floor, the wheelchair gone. She was screaming in the hallway. Her cries bounced off the walls. A hollowness grew inside her, shaking, tears stinging. No, no, the stories, his stories, folded tightly inside her. Thank you. Um, thanks, Simon. Uh, thanks for having us here. Um, so I just got two short poems to share with you, and then I want to tell you a little story about uh, uh, about me and my trip and water and how it all kind of relates to water and life. Um, so I, I'm a well, I think of myself as a fiction writer. Uh, I don't primarily read. I write poetry, but I don't read it or share it all that much. But I have some poems to share, so um, hopefully they're not too terrible. Um, so this one and both of the poems are based off uh, photographs. Um, and my de so this is how it sort of relates to uh, um, the issue at Standing Rock. Uh, my dad, uh, during the, uh, in the 70s, he was part of the American Indian Movement, and he was um, one of the people that participated in the takeover of Wounded Knee. And uh, he used to tell, when I was a kid, he used to tell me these stories about um, 
about Wounded Knee and having shootouts with the FBI. And uh, he was um, he was arrested along with Dennis Banks and um, the guy I'm named after, Kenny Loudhock, um, in <coughs> Oregon. And uh, I guess so. Uh, allegedly, they were they were they were my dad and Kenny Loudhock were in a station wagon, and they were following a, a motorhome that belonged to Marlon Brando. And uh, it was at least registered to Marlon Brando. And uh, Leonard Peltier and Dennis Banks and Kamuk Banks. Um, there may have been some other people in the motorhome. Anyway, Oregon State Trooper pulled him over. There were some shots fired, and then my dad and Kenny Lothock were arrested. So um, that's my dad and how his sort of activism plays, plays a role in uh, sort of my, uh, my intellectual uh, progress up to this point. So here's this picture. I don't know if you guys really see. So this is during the. Um, I imagine it's like during the 70s sometime. But uh, he's right here with the blue hat and he's eating a sandwich and his see how his hands kind of blurry, he's like reaching for this cup of coffee. At least I imagine. Or he's gonna flip someone. So uh, <laughs> so I wrote this song um, about my dad. It's called uh, it's called Time. Okay. <clears throat> There's a photograph of my father. He sits at the table with two men. He smiles and eats a sandwich and reaches for a cup of coffee. He is in Oglala, South Dakota, the home of the Lakota, and I am here in Phoenix, in the future, in the present, and he is fixed in the past. My father, my father could tell stories. My father was a man, a man before he knew my mother, a man who grew up in foster homes, a man who went to war, a man who jumped out of war planes and remembers the sound of AKs and remembers the smell of his own blood, and remembers red power. Does he remember me? Does he remember how I idealized him, how I wore my raider's cap like him, how I mimicked his walk and his talk? I remember. I remember the long car rides. I remember his long hair. I remember long absences. I remember the smell of his breath, coffee and cigarettes. As he kissed my forehead, I was just a boy. I am a man here, now, in the present and the future, and my father was a man before, as he sits fixed in the past at the table, he smiles, he eats a sandwich, and reaches for a cup of coffee. I have this other poem that I wrote uh, recently, um, and it's about, and I've been, uh, been uh, sort of homesick off and on here. I'm originally from Nevada, up by uh, northern Nevada, up by um, Reno. And uh, so I'm from uh, from two different tribes, the Northern Paiute and the Western Shoshone. And where I grew up is uh, the Northern Paiute from the people called the Doidakuta people, which means the Thule eaters. And um, from my grandma's house, um, you can see this uh, the mountain here. I don't know if you guys can see it. There's a peak right there. Um, it's called uh, Fox Peak, and uh, that's part of uh, where the Paiute people get their creation story from. Is from that peak right there. And they say there's a spring of water up there that. Um, the father used to drink from, or you know, the, the god, I guess, if you want to call him. Um, there's a spring of water up there, and also there used to be two two big white rocks up there that were sort of that you could see, um, that were sort of up there, right, right below the peak there. And uh, I guess during World War II, um, the the U.S. Navy, uh, their um, fighter planets, they used those for uh, target practice, so it's no longer there. So. Uh, so in a sense, part of our creation story as Pai, Northern Pai people has been destroyed by the military, which is not uncommon for a lot of indigenous people to have some of their lands destroyed. So um, I was up late one night, like I usually am, uh, thinking and writing, and uh, I wrote this poem about this uh, about this um, this peak here, and uh, and I, I can't, I'm not fluent in my indigenous language, so I sort of wrote it as if I was trying to think about how I would learn Paiute or Shoshone. So it's it's really kind of written in these sort of uh, very simple uh, phrases. It's called returning again. Man thinks. Man thinks, then acts. Man leaves. Man thinks again. Man returns. Man talks. Man tells stories. Man finds. Man is here, pointing to self, heart, chest, Man tries to form words. Man has tongue. Tongue cannot wrap around words. Words taste like dirt, earth, mother. Man seeks. Man is lost. Man is here, points to self, heart, chest. Man leaves again. Man returns. Man looks to mountain, peak, 
Father, man is here, touches, fills dirt, earth, mother with hand, body. Man offers water, man drinks water, man holds water. Man gives thanks, man apologizes, man apologizes again. <clears throat> So that's the one uh, it's sort of about water returning home, being uh, conscious of the land and landscapes around us. So and I got this other story that I just want to tell real quick about water. Um, when I went, uh, I don't know if you guys or some of the people from ASU are aware of this story last semester, but I went on a, um, I went on a uh, bicycle tour of Nevada. Um, uh, it was about a thousand miles. I circled around uh, nor the northern part of Nevada. Um, and uh, when I, I camped out next to Pyramid Lake uh, up there one night, and before I went to Pyramid Lake, I, uh, I, I, did, I talked to some of the American Indian students at the University of Nevada, Reno, and um, I told them that I was a little uh, worried about camping out next to Pyramid Lake, um, because when I was a teenager, we camped out next to another lake, uh, Walker Lake, and um, I had this dream that uh, something came out of the lake and tried to pull me back in the water. And so I'm kind of like freaked out about camping out next to bodies of water, um, lakes, oceans, uh, rivers, whatever. They kind of freak me out. I, I told, uh, I was talking to the, the, um, the part of the, the students, the American Indian students and the American Indian student organization. There, and uh, I told them this story and this uh, the Shoshone girl, um, Marissa Weaseltail, she kind of smiled and I noticed she was kind of like smiling and then, um, after I did my little presentation, she came up to me and she said, uh, you know, um, if, you, if you go down to the lake and you, um, you, you take your water and you offer your water to the lake and then you wash your hands with the lake, or you wash your face with the lake water and you ask for permission to spend the night there, they'll leave you alone. And that's why she sees that they'll leave you alone. She kind of smiled at me. I said, okay, that's a good idea. <laughs> so, I, so I rode my bike that, uh, I think it was about 45 or 50 miles out to the lake from Reno, and I got there, and I went down, and I did what she said, and I slept fine, and, 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 and you know, whatever it was that left me alone that night. So um, that's my little story about water, um, and uh, that's all I have, so thanks for listening. Well, thank you, Kenny. Well, we're out of time. So we won't be able to continue. Our designated time was 2.30 to 3.30, and it's past that. So we'll call it quits here, all right? <laughs> Next time, we'll read my poem. <laughs> you can read them, uh, pick up my books. Sand <laughs> <laughs> Creek, out there somewhere. Uh, I two of them, out of, I don't know what, 25 or so. They're also published in uh, Chinese, uh, Korean, uh, German, and Italian. So if you read those languages, please. Thank you very much. And support Standing Rock is very important. It really is bearing on all of us. It's not just a struggle by indigenous people for water or for the right to have sovereignty and do what you want. But it really involves all of us. Because we are indeed one people.